Last week, we covered the first 11 verses of John 18. Over the last couple weeks, the Lord has really been stirring in my heart, and I've been seeking him on, on his heart for me and for us as a church. And I began studying to, to continue on through the Gospel of John, but what he's been stirring in my heart I believe is is a word from him for us. And as he was stirring these things in my heart, I just saw these things in chapter 18. In the first 11, 12 verses. So we'll we'll technically gain one one verse as we we make our way forward through the Gospel of John. But I want to go back. Last week, we covered these verses verse by verse. Uh, This week, we're just going to kind of grab some points out of here. And and specifically, today, with our time in the Word, I want to make three observations of our Lord, three observations of Jesus. And then I want to make application and then we'll go watch the Super Bowl. Let's begin. You can read along with me silently. You can close your Bible and listen, perhaps. I'm going to read the first 12 verses of John 18, just to kind of reorient ourselves with this section. When, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus, Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am The word he in italics there is added in for clarity. It wasn't the best uh, choice by the translators. God bless them. Jesus says, I am. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them when Jesus said to them, I am. They, all the guys with lanterns and torches and weapons, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Perhaps that time bracing themselves for impact. Jesus answered, verse 8, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup, that cup of wrath that the Father has given me? So, verse 12, the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And we'll pause there. When you zoom out, it's a, it's a fascinating idea to ponder that God, the Son, through whom all things were created, enters into 
creation. He becomes one of his own creatures, truly God and truly human. And he comes not in power and authority like we would suspect or like we would if we were him. He will come in that way when he comes back again. Talked about that a little bit last week. But in his first coming, he presents himself meek and lowly. And here we see him, the creator who has entered into his own creation, now arrested and bound by his own creation. He came to his own, the scriptures say, and his own received him not. Fascinating stuff. As we consider this story for the second time, the first observation I want to make about Jesus is number one, Jesus loves the Father radically. Number one, Jesus loves the Father radically. In verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden. And I, I mentioned this last week. I want to mention it again that this garden is the garden called Gethsemane, which means literally oil press or olive press. It's the place of press, pressing. It's the place of crushing. And we didn't, I don't think, uh, look at the other Gospels. Typically, when I'm, when I'm going through the Gospel of John, I want to stay in the Gospel of John. Uh, there's so much right here in the text that there's no way we can leave uh, every stone unturned, you know. Uh, it would be here forever. And so while it's tempting to cross-reference and, and do the parallels with the other Gospels, uh, for the most part, I try and just stick to the Gospel of John. But I want to read to you from Luke's Gospel. Luke 22, we're going to read verses 41 through 44. Because it's just on my heart to, to revisit this and to make this reference because where, where John just kind of he, he acknowledges that they walk down from Jerusalem across the brook Kidron and, and there in a nook on the Mount of Olives they enter into the Garden of Gethsemane, which is beautiful, by the way. Um, it's very tranquil if you've had the opportunity to visit there. Has anybody been to Israel and had the opportunity? Oh, one of these days. It's worth it. It brings the Bible to life in so many ways. And, and I'm having a moment right now where I, I'm, I'm reading the scriptures and I'm just picturing walking through the Garden of Gethsemane. These, these trees look like they've been there forever, you know? And, and it's, I, I can see why Jesus liked to gather there with his disciples often. He prayed there at this time. John omits this. Luke includes it. Luke tells us, Luke twenty two forty one, and he, Jesus, withdrew from them, the disciples, about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed. Remember, this is right before Jesus is going to go to the cross. This is right before he's arrested in, in our story like we read. It says, he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, the cup of wrath. It didn't sound like a fun way to spend his evening. Yes? Father, if there's any way that, that, that we can do this another way. <laughs> This is his humanity, and I love the, the, the real, the way Jesus is real with his father. He's, he's not, there's no mask here. This is, this is as real as it gets. 
if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We ought to be real with the Lord in prayer. There's no sense in lying to the one who knows the truth anyways. But Jesus, though he is real with the Father, he's also very reverent and, and, and yielding and, and submitting to the Father. I want to do that too. I want to be real and reverent. I want to, I want to be submitted I want to finish my prayers like Jesus. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And it says, there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. So the father, of course, does not remove the cup from him. Jesus must and will drink the cup of wrath being set forth as a propitiation. We've talked about the, the Bible word propitiation several times here in the Gospel of John. A propitiation is a sacrifice that bears the wrath of God or drinks the cup of wrath to the end. And in doing so, turns God's wrath toward us into favor. He turns it into grace, right? So the Father doesn't remove the cup from him, but sends an angel to minister to him and strengthen him. I love that. This whole story, we're not, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and there is a heavenly host of angels that the Lord employs to go and, and f- engage and fight in this spiritual war. This is, this is a radical uh, scene here before the cross. Luke goes on to say, and being in agony. Again, fascinating to consider. God the Son, through whom all things are created, entering into his own creation, about to be set forth as a propitiation for sinful people like me and you. Now praying in agony. This is the battle before the cross in prayer. Being in agony, Luke says, he prayed more earnestly. And check this out. It says, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. You can Google the interesting science facts about this this whole ordeal. If you choose to, it is interesting. But for the sake of time, I just want to ask the question, why? Why such agony? Why sweat becoming like great drops of blood falling to the ground? Two, two reasons have primarily been suggested here. Jesus is agonized, one, because of the physical beating he's about to take. I don't know if you were spanked as a kid. I was. And you get those words, you know, go to your room. (laughs) And you sit there and you know what's coming, right? Jesus is about to not take a spoon to the rear. He's about to be scourged. With a cat of nine tails, a a whip, nine leather straps with balls of lead on it, on each, to cause inflammation and swelling. And then sharp pieces of bone and sometimes glass to then latch onto the swollen flesh to bite it and rip it off. 40 lashes of this, save one, 39 lashes, he was about to take. And that in and of itself would often kill somebody before they would be crucified. It was this radical, traumatic thing, scourging. He was about to undergo 
this type of punishment on our behalf. And then with his back and organs exposed, to be pinned to a cross, struck, spat upon, with a, with, a, with a crown of thorns beat into his scalp, nails in his hands and nails in his feet, a slow, excruciating death. Why is Jesus in agony? Well, one obvious reason is that he's about to take this physical torture and, and brutal death. But not only is he agonized because of the, the physicality of this passion narrative, not only the physical, but the spiritual. It's not merely physical. He is spiritually bearing in himself the weight of our sin and the wrath of God injustice, radical reality. Furthermore, we've been talking a lot about the triune nature of God, how God is love, existing in perfect harmony and love through all of eternity past in a way that, that is a, a perfect expression of love, in a way that is perfectly and thoroughly Fulfilled. God is perfectly fulfilled within his own nature, Father, Son, and Spirit. Through all of eternity past, he didn't create us and redeem us because he was lonely. No, perfectly fulfilled in love. Freely he created. Freely he redeems. Not because he was lacking anything. This perfect fellowship that is totally fulfilling in an absolute and entire way. This communion and relationship that he has experienced with the Father and the Holy Spirit within the Godhead for the first time in eternal history is about to be disturbed. I like to, to quote, I, I just think it's helpful the way Daniel the prophet uh, describes this. He says, the Messiah will be cut off. And I've also always, you guys, most of you have heard me say this, but it's like the universe almost glitches. It's like everything wigs out when Jesus says, my God, my God, from the cross, he says, why have you forsaken me? The Father turns his face away. The sky goes black. The earth begins to shake and quake. The graves open up and dead people start to want, read the gospels. I'm not making this stuff up. They start to come out of their tombs and it's like this, it's like this cataclysmic glitch. This, this, everything wigs out because this, this community of love, that is God. That perfect relationship with the Father that he's enjoyed and been fulfilled by and a part of in the unity and love of the Holy Spirit, it's disturbed for the first and only time in eternal history. The thought of being separated from the Father, isolated on the cross, that is even more agonizing it has been suggested, and I agree, than the physical pain he's about to endure. The thought of being separate or far from the Father. To, to, to be cursed on the tree. No longer enjoying the blessing that is found in the Holy Spirit. That is more agonizing than anything, so much so that, that his heart is to go to the cross. But the thought of this is agonizing. He says, if there's any way that this cup, take, take this cup away from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And, and more earnestly, he prays, and, and the sweat and the blood and the whole thing, it's this radical picture. Why do I bring all this up? I bring it up to say that Jesus loves the Father radically. <laughs> he doesn't love the Father mostly. Jesus fulfills the great command. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all. With all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Jesus talked about, didn't he, how our, our love for God should, should be so significant, so all-consuming that our love for our family for our mother and father and sister and brother and son and daughter is like hatred by way of comparison. Spurgeon, on this point, said, who could fulfill so great a command? None but Jesus. He fulfills perfectly this, this radical love for the Father. When I consider this text, Jesus went to the garden. And I make the reference to the Gospel of Luke. I observe in Christ that Christ loves the Father radically. Number two, Jesus loves people intentionally. Number one, Jesus loves the Father radically. Number two, Jesus loves people intentionally. He loves people intentionally. Verse four, John 18, verse four, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, again, he knows of the physicality, he knows of the scourging, he knows of the cross. He knows of the spiritual reality. He knows that, that the, the Father is going to turn his face away. You know the blessing in the Old Testament. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. This, this, this blessing that is this major theme throughout all of the biblical narrative, all of biblical history. You trace this blessing through... Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and David. And, 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 and it's just like, man, everybody yearns for the blessing to have the Father be gracious and cause his face to shine upon. Jesus bears the exact opposite of that on the cross. He who knew no sin is made sin. Cursed is the one who hangs upon a tree. What happens with the fall? Not blessing, but the curse. On the cross. It's as if it could be said of Jesus, the Lord curse thee. Be righteously indignant and full of wrath toward you. The Father turn his face away. Jesus knew all that was going to happen to him. But because of his love toward the Father radically and his love for you and for me personally, Jesus intentionally goes to the cross. Jesus, number two, loves people intentionally. They came with torches and lanterns. I mentioned this last week. Perhaps wondering if they were going to have to search him out of the nooks and crannies or behind the trees in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
but they didn't have to do any sort of search like that. Jesus doesn't shrink away. Jesus, verse four, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward. He came forward. He intentionally initiates the chain of events for our redemption. He loves people intentionally. He goes to the cross intentionally. And like I talked about last week, he then demonstrates that he's in control. He's in power. He says, I am. They say, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. He doesn't say, oh yeah, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. He quotes the burning bush passage in Exodus 3. He says, ego e me. I am. That's how God identified himself to Moses there. I am that I am. Whom are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. I am. And they all fall backwards. Jesus is in control. No one takes my life from me, he said. I willingly lay it down. After demonstrating that he is truly the one in command, he says, verse 11, second part of the verse, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? He knows all that's coming to him, verse four. In verse 11, after winning the battle in prayer, he is ready to say, shall I not drink the cup that the Father's given to me? Radical. Look at verse 12. So, because of all of this, the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. That phrase comes up a couple times in this chapter. They bound him. They would bind sheep to the altar lest it wiggle off. Obviously, it wasn't a happy thing or a comfortable thing for the sheep on the altar, yeah? So they would bind the sheep to the altar. But Jesus wasn't a wiggly sheep, though he was bound. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, Genesis 22 who willingly submits to the will of his father as they climb the mountain. Abraham was an old man. He wasn't in his prime no more. Isaac, most agree, was about Jesus' age. In his late 20s or early 30s. Isaac was in his prime. Point being... Abraham could not have forced Isaac on the altar. But in the will of the Father in heaven, and in submission and according to the will of his father, Abraham, Isaac agrees to go up the mountain. And Isaac willingly, unlike the squirmy sheep, this strong young man in faith, Faith that he got from his father, who Hebrews tells us supposed that even if, if God allowed him to go through with killing Isaac, that God must be able to raise him from the dead because God promised that through Isaac would the nations be blessed and a nation be born, more descendants than the stars in the sky. Abraham believed God and was willing to submit to God. And, and, and Isaac in a way that is in harmony with his father, is bound to the altar, not by force, but he intentionally presents himself in that way. Jesus being bound by these soldiers and religious leaders, when he is arrested and it says they bound him, This is an intentional act of love toward us. Biblical love. I've shared this before. Definition I got from Vodi Bauckham. Biblical love is an act of the will, 
accompanied by emotion that leads to action on behalf of its object. This is biblical love. His being bound is an intentional act of love toward us on behalf of us. Jesus, number one, loves the Father radically. And number two, Jesus loves people intentionally. Thirdly, Jesus takes discipleship seriously. Number three, Jesus takes discipleship seriously. Again, we went verse by verse through like normal last week. Uh, we'll get back to that, I, I think, next week. <laughs> and this week we're jumping around. Look, look back with me to verse one. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron and there, uh, where there was a garden. She and his disciples entered. It's implied as you read the Gospel of John, as we've been studying through the Gospel of John, what are the words that Jesus had spoken? Again, when Jesus had spoken these words, verse 1, he went with his disciples to Gethsemane. But today I want to articulate intentionally what words he spoke. What words are we referring to in verse 1 that he spoke? First, the upper room discourse. This meaningful time of teaching. Just hours before his arrest. When Jesus had spoken these words, teaching them in the upper room discourse. Secondly, John chapter 17 the immediate chapter right before verse 1 of chapter 18, the high priestly prayer, where Jesus offers up words of intercessory prayer on behalf of his guys. When Jesus had spoken these words, now that he had covered them in prayer, he goes with them to Gethsemane. Jesus takes discipleship seriously. That involves meaningful times of teaching. That also involves meaningful times of prayer. And then as, as you keep reading, you see that it also involves frequent times in his presence they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, verse 1. And verse 2 says, Now Judas, who betrayed Jesus, also knew that place, for Jesus often met with, uh, he met there with his disciples. Jesus frequently, he often met with his disciples in Gethsemane. So in the first two verses of this chapter, we see that Jesus takes discipleship seriously. He's preparing his guys. He's equipping his guys. What is a disciple? A disciple is an apprentice. A disciple is one who spends time with the master, who over time becomes like the master, and then over time carries on the work of the master. What does discipleship include? It includes meaningful times of teaching. He had spoken these words to them meaningfully, uh, in, in a meaningful way, teaching them in the upper room discourse. Discipleship also includes meaningful times in prayer. He lifts them up to the Father as he's carried along by the power of the Holy Spirit. Discipleship also includes frequent times in his presence. He met there with them often. Judas knew where to find him. Jesus, number one, loves the Father radically. Number two, loves people intentionally. And number three, he takes discipleship seriously. So much could we say about discipleship. But, but right now, I just want to point out that it is exceedingly clear with even a, a quick reading through the Gospels and New Testament that Jesus is all about discipleship.
we begin to shift gears and, and get ready to land the plane, I want to I want to not only make observations of Jesus, but I want to I want to draw application for me and for us as a local church and as a Christian. It's important to know why we're here. What is what is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose and goal of this church? Locally and the church universally, corporately. What is our, our vision? What is our mission? I've tried to say some, somewhat frequently that we exist to glorify God. By loving him and loving people and making disciples of Jesus. This statement is rooted in the scriptures. The goal for me was not to be original, it was to be biblical. We exist to glorify God. That is rooted in the great purpose of God in all of scripture and in all of history. Why does God do everything that he does? It is for his own glory. Any honest theologian or student of the scripture will come to that same conclusion. The great and primary purpose of God is the glory of God. So we exist to glorify God. How? By loving him. This is rooted in the great commandment. What's the greatest commandment, Jesus? It's to love the Lord your God with all with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We exist to glorify God then, according to the great purpose of God, to glorify God. How? According to the great command of God, by loving God. Is that it? No, Jesus said, well, the second command is just like it. <laughs> it's to love people. And in and, and, and a way where your love of God is overflowing forth from you, to those around you. So we exist to glorify God by loving him and loving people. But then, before his ascension into heaven, he commissions his people. The great purpose of God, the great command of God, the great commission of God for the church. That is to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ, to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go, go to Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the whole world. Go and make disciples. But it's interesting because each of those three parts in so many ways are very much they're, they're cliches in the church, right? I mean, if, if you look at most church websites, you'll see some iteration of this. Knowing God and making him known, you know, however, however it comes out. And, and cliches are interesting. Uh, the word cliche, if you look it up on Google, you know, a cliche is a trite phrase or expression, something that has become overly familiar or commonplace. Wikipedia, so take it with a grain of salt, but Wikipedia said, most phrases now considered cliched originally were regarded as striking, considered meaningful or novel, but have lost their force through overuse. It's interesting in light of our discussion this morning. It's Super Bowl Sunday, so I gotta talk about football at least once. Defense wins championships, as the cliche proclaims. You see the big capital D and then the fence. Defense, you know, defense wins championships. Uh, everybody's talking about football right now uh, for the most part, and I recently heard somebody say that Yes, there are things that, you know, what, what makes a championship football team? 
listing a few different characteristics of football teams, the guy then said, you know, a great defense. People say defense wins championships. But then he, he also added on to that, saying, but you, you, you need more than a defense. I mean, if, you're, if, if your offense doesn't put any points on the board, how are you supposed to win, right? Even the greatest defense needs an offense to put points on the board. The cliche, he, he, he kind of picked it apart. But then I couldn't help but have this next thought because growing up, Ray Lewis was my favorite guy. You know, I would, I would be out there on the field. Uh, in middle school, I was always number 52 because I wanted to be just like Ray Lewis, middle linebacker uh, back in the day for the Baltimore Ravens. They embodied Ray Lewis and, and, and Ed Reed and, and these guys. They embodied that cliche. And when, when, when a team, and, and when, when a person and when a team embodies a cliche, it is really striking. It is, it is what did Wikipedia say? It, it was originally striking, meaningful, novel, uh, a, a force. That was Ray Lewis and the Baltimore Ravens. Well, but, but didn't the other guy say that you still need an offense to score points? Not when you have a linebacker and leader like Ray Lewis and a defense like the Ravens had several times in their Super Bowl winning season, the defense scored more points than the offense. Ed Reed would make an interception and run it back for six or whatever. You know, I think Joe Flacco was their quarterback at the time and, and then earlier uh, Trent Dilfer. These guys, the, the offense wasn't putting points on the board. But when you have a team that really embodies the cliche, it's more powerful than you'd ever really think when you hear over... Uh, overly used statements like defense wins championships. We exist to glorify God. We hear that all the time. Though you see that in many places and said by many people, I'll include myself in this, do you see me, do you see churches, do you see people embody it? by loving him and loving people and making disciples. What's on my heart? I think a word from the Lord for, for me and for Northwest Church. Lean in. Don't let it just be a word on a website or a flyer or whatever. A cliche is so much more than a cliche when embodied. So I believe as we observe Jesus, number one, loving the Father radically, number two, loving people intentionally, number three, taking discipleship seriously, I believe the Lord would say to me and to us, number one, love God radically. The word radical, since we're defining English words, it means with regard to origin or root, in a complete or basic manner, thoroughly or fundamentally, love God like that. What is the origin or root? Jesus is the origin and root. And he loved the Father so radically that the mere thought of separation or a disturbance in communion with the Father was so much that, that he, he needed an angel to come and strengthen him and, 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 and help him through that thought and, and, and to pray. And, and he sweat in prayer and, and it became like great drops of blood. Do you sweat it? I believe the Lord would say to me, Jake, do you, do you sweat it if you're going to be out of my presence or, or not in communion with me for any given amount of time? So often, we don't sweat that. 
May God give me and us grace to grow in our love for him. That it might not just be a cliche that we hear or proclaim, but a a striking and meaningful and novel force in this generation. Our love for God. May God give us grace and increase our capacity to love him radically in a Christ-like way. Secondly, to love people intentionally. Friends, you will never drift into Christ-like love toward people. You, you, all we like sheep, Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. We are like sheep and we are prone to wander. We're like a car with messed up alignment. You know, we just pull. <laughs> we just pull to the left or right. You'll never drift into Christ-like love toward God or people unless you are intentional. Jesus did not shrink away. Jesus did not passively wait. Verse four says Jesus came forward. Jesus loves intentionally. So what does that mean for me? What does that mean for you? What does that mean for us as human beings trying to disciple, be disciples of Jesus, to imitate him? It means schedule the date night with your wife. It means go in the yard and play catch with your kid. It means pick up the phone and call your parent or your loved one. First John says, let us not love in word or in tongue, in talk, but let us love in deed and in truth. One translation says, with actions. Biblical love is an act of the will, so act with your will. It's an act of the will accompanied by emotion that leads to action on behalf of its object. Love people. Most Christians and churches would say, I, I desire to be loving towards people, warm and, and gracious and kind towards people. But they're not. This is difficult for me because I'm an introvert and my default is not intentional love towards people. My default is to just do my own thing. That's just the way God wired me. When I went into public school, my mom had to literally give me a pep talk and be like, Jake, you have one of those resting faces, buddy. So uh, when you're walking down the hall, smile, because like, she was nervous because I was homeschooled in grade school and then went to public school in seventh grade. Uh, she was low-key nervous because my default is just, <laughs> you know. And if you want to have friends, you got to be friendly kind of a thing. And my default is just not that. My mom and the Lord would say to me, I think, and to us, we need to love intentionally. No more good intentions without follow through. <laughs> no, intentionally follow through. Love God radically. Love people intentionally. Finally, take discipleship seriously. Do you think of yourself as a disciple? The Great Commission was for them in the first century to go into the uttermost parts of the world, like Oregon, and to make disciples of Jesus. Has that been fulfilled in me or in you? Is that being fulfilled in us? Well, what, what, what would that involve? We observed in the life of Jesus, so much more can be said, but, but just in this text, we see that Jesus, he takes disciples, discipleship seriously, and that involves meaningful times of teaching. Are you devoted 
like Acts 2.42 says of the early church, they continued steadfastly. Another version says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and breaking bread and prayer. Are you devoted? Are you committed to teaching? Not only on a Sunday morning, but also as a teacher. So we need to be taught, but we also need to teach. Are, are, are you teaching your kids? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you coming alongside your spouse and, and, and taking discipleship seriously in, in that way? Or are, are you not only reaching forward or reaching ahead or reaching up to the Apostle Paul or the Apostle John or to the, the authors of Scripture or, or to somebody who's maybe been walking with the Lord longer than you. It's important that we reach up and, and have people pull us along. But man, we also need to reach back or down or, or however you want to phrase it to, to help people that perhaps we're further along then develop in their discipleship. The goal is not to make disciples of you the last thing we need is little Jakes. That's terrifying. Uh, Christians are little Christ. That's what the word Christian means, a little Christ. Are you helping others, reaching forward and reaching back as one body in love, in discipleship, in, in your life? Just like we observe Jesus' life, we, we just obviously see Jesus take discipleship seriously, and that involves times of teaching. Is that true in your life? Secondly, discipleship involves meaningful times of prayer. Is that you? Are you not only, maybe you're devoted to teaching, but what about your prayer life? This is convicting for us all, I think. Are you given to prayer? Accomplish serious work in the secret place. Do you know about the secret place? Jesus said, lock yourself away in a closet or something. And just go before the Father who, who, who sees you and, and hears you in prayer in the secret place. This worship leader, Stephanie Gretzinger, I heard her say recently that in our culture, don't we, we, we have this thing where we say, hi, how are you doing? And then we, and we keep walking. Our language says, I care and I want to know you. But our behavior says the opposite. I'm not saying that we, that's a sin to say. I'm just saying it's an interesting point. And we can often do that with the Lord. Devotionals are great. Uh, I'm so thankful for guys like C.H. Spurgeon with his morning and evening. Uh, I've been greatly blessed by the, the handful of authors that, that put together the Streams in the Desert devotional. I love that one. Highly recommend the Streams in the Desert devotional. But we wouldn't need, hear my heart here, this delicate kind of, but we wouldn't need somebody else to get in the secret place and, and hear from the Lord if we would just be people of prayer and the word. I can't remember who I heard say that, but it was like, whoa, it's so true. Do you know what it is to not only say, hi, how are you doing to the Lord, or, or skim a chapter for your Bible reading for the day, but to really get in the secret place with the Lord, who because he turned his face away from the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, is now able to, to graciously cause his face to shine upon you in the secret place. Do, do you take this seriously? This, this is a discipleship thing. Do you, do you fast and pray? That's a lost concept in our culture. Discipleship involves meaningful times of teaching, meaningful times of prayer, finally, frequent times in his presence. And I kind of mixed those two, but it's okay. In his presence. We gather in his presence at church. We go off to our own spot. Jesus liked to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Where's your spot? 
the secret place. But then also, when you're mowing the lawn, are you aware that he's with you? When you're taking a shower, I think of the psalmist when, I think it was David, but in the Psalms for sure, the psalmist says, I meditate upon you in the night watches. Just on bed, in, in, in bed, when, when you can't sleep, I meditate on you, O Lord, in the night watches. Does it, does it ring true in your soul, that worship song I, I, I play from time to time? In the glory of your presence, I find rest. In the depths of your love, I find peace. I love, I love your presence. Jesus got alone with the Lord in the garden, another old hymn. Do you, do you frequently visit the garden in the way that the hymn writer did when he says, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses? And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of Man discloses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. We exist to glorify God by loving him and loving people and making disciples of Jesus. May we become people who embody these things in a way where they're not mere cliches on a website or bulletin, but in a way that, that is striking and meaningful and novel and a force in this generation. May we love God radically, love people intentionally, and take discipleship seriously. In Jesus' name.